In this episode of Microbiology, we're going to take a look at Yersinia pestis, the cause of the plague. So welcome back to another episode of our Microbiology series. In this video, I want to take a look at Yersinia pestis. Yersinia pestis is the causative agent of the plague. It is considered a gram-negative bacillus. It's a gram-negative bacteria. The bacteria can survive and proliferate in phagocytic cells. Phagocytic means destruction. Phagocytic means to eat, to destroy. And so unlike other bacteria that might be destroyed by phagocytic cells of the body, these things dig it. This is their crib. They love it. They hang out. They proliferate. They enjoy it. You get the idea. They are considered a zoonotic disease. And what a zoonotic means is that it's a disease that can be passed between animals and humans. If you recall more recently, we've had things like the bird flu and the swine flu. Those fears as far as getting into the human population, that would be an example of diseases that can pass the species barrier between an animal and a human. So the plague, Yersinia pestis, is one that can be both infect animals as well as humans. So urban rats in some parts of the world would be a carriers, ground squirrels, and prairie dogs in the American Southwest. Yes, I said ground squirrels and prairie dogs. People who aren't familiar with this go, wait, prairie dogs? Really? Yes, prairie dogs. Um, Plague-infected fleas, of course, I think this is what we're most familiar with. These typically eat off the natural rat reservoir when they are unable to be satisfied that way, when it's not enough food. Then they jump to something else, i.e. us humans, and take a bite. You can also get the plague, uh, Yersinia pestis, through other means. For example, if you skin a infected animal, you can get the plague. If you get scratches and bites you can get the plague. There's also been cases of people getting the plague from a domestic cat lick. So yeah, good times. So there are three flavors of Yersinia pestis, uh, the plague that I want to talk about. And that is bubonic, septicemic, and pneumonic. So let's begin first by probably looking at the most famous of them all, and that would be the bubonic plague. And this is the most common presentation. And Ironically, this is a good thing. When you hear about the other two, the bubonic is probably the better of the three to get. Not that you want to have them, but of the three, this is probably the better one to get. You'll find out why in a minute. Uh, this is the one that devastated Europe and Asia. Symptoms are going to include the swollen, tender lymph nodes, and they create what we call the buboes. And that is where uh, most people are familiar with the bubonic plague. If untreated, it has a mortality rate of 50 to 75%. Now, you're saying, you just said that if you could have any of the three, this is the one to have. But 50 to 75% mortality rate? Are you crazy? Yes, because the other ones have like a 100% fatality rate. So, again, it's not like you're going to go out and say, hey, give me some of that bubonic. It's just compared to the three, this one sucks the least, all right? So it's not transmittable from person to person. And small percentage of patients may develop what we call a secondary pneumonic plague. This is where things get bad. If, by the way, pneumonic, pneumonia, okay? So here's how it works. The bacteria is going to enter the bloodstream. It's going to proliferate, grow, reproduce, party on in the lymph and blood. It's able to survive and thrive within phagocytic cells, as I said earlier. The lymph nodes in the groin and armpit enlarge. Fever will develop as the body's defenses try to fight. And of course, you have the swelling called the buboes. So what are the symptoms of bubonic plague? The incubation period is from 2 to 10 days with an acute onset, onset excuse me, of malaise, meaning you're tired, you're just oh, exhausted, fever, chills, and weakness. Up to 24 hours later, one or more lymph node becomes swollen, forming the buboes, which is between 1 to 10 centimeters wide. And as I said earlier, it often develops in the groin and sometimes under the arm and on the neck. Uh, I will have a link, by the way, in the description. This is to the FAS.org uh, site, which will give you fact sheets about the plague if you're interested in more information. 
Now, if untreated, bubonic plague will progress into septicemic form, may progress, I should say, into septicemic form, spreading via the bloodstream to the rest of the body, including the central nervous system. That's never a good place for a disease to go, where it can cause meningitis and to the lungs, causing pneumonic plague. Mortality rate for bubonic plague is around 13.5% in the United States. So here's the next variation of the disease. This is septicemic, and this is not transmittable from person to person, which is a good thing. Small percentage of patients may develop secondary pneumonic plague, bad, that can be spread via droplets to other humans. Droplets, of course, being spit, little droplets of spit as you, <laughs> you cough, all that fun stuff. So always cover, cover that mouth when you cough and sneeze. Can arise secondary to bubonic, and the bacteria enters the blood and proliferates and can cause septic shock. Now, here is an un ugh, icky picture. This is some of the symptoms. So primary septicemic plague is less common and presents without bubo. So you're not getting the swollen lymph nodes that you get in the bubonic plague. Primary or secondary can present with fever, chills, nausea, abdominal pain, and vomiting. The advanced stages can exhibit necrosis in fingers. Necrosis means dead tissue. So if you look at the image, that is dead tissue that you're seeing there. The tissue is dying, necrosis. So necrosis in the fingers, in the toes, in the nose. Again, if you look at this graphic, you can see the discoloration. You can also see the discoloration of, of the person's nose. So that is dead tissue that you see there. You can also get something called disseminated intravascular coagulation or DIC. What this is, is that the blood will clot within the blood vessels. And that's not a good thing. So you get these clotting uh, things happening in the blood vessels. You get purple blotches of skin caused by subcutaneous bleeding and mortality rate in the United States is approximately 22% with treatment. So again, if bubonic has about a 13.5% uh, mortality rate in the United States, this one has a 22% with treatment. No treatment, you're dead. 100% uh, fatality rate. The other variation of this is the pneumonic plague. This is think pneumonia, think in the chest, in the lungs, pneumonic. This is, we're talking about lungs here. Approximately 12% of the total cases in the U.S. over the last 50 years have been this variation of the plague. It can be transmitted from person to animal or to person to person via airborne droplets. Again, this is the sneezing and the coughing with the spit coming out. Again, cover your mouth when you cough, cover your mouth when you sneeze, um, wash hands frequently, all that good stuff. Mortality rate is around 100%, okay? So if there's no treatment, you're dead. Persons may be, must be treated within 12 to 15 hours after the onset of the fever. Death usually occurs within three days. So it is very important that once this hits, treatment is given almost immediately. So some of the symptoms, incubation period is roughly two to four days for primary pneumonic plague. Onset is acute, it happens, boom, there it is with a high fever, trouble breathing, and cough, which may produce watery or bloody sputum. That's the thing that you spit up, all right? And a lovely sound on a microphone. The resulting pneumonic uh, progresses rapidly, resulting in death if untreated. There's no ifs, ands, or buts about this one. Mortality rate for primary pneumonic plague is 57% in the U.S. So the bubonic plague had a 13.5. The septicemic had a 22%. And pneumonic has a 57% mortality rate. So you see why I said of all the three, okay? So no discussion of the plague of Yersinia pestis would be complete without talking about the pandemics these things have caused. And we're gonna take a look at the plague of Justinia. We're gonna take a look at the Black Death and the modern plague. The plague of Justinia, this began in Egypt and swept across Europe between 541 to 542 AD. Now look at this number. Around 50 to 60% of the population in North Africa, Europe, Central, and South Asia died. Imagine if you're living during this time. This is an apocalyptic thing. This is, we, we here, we live in post-apocalypse times from their point of view. 50 to 60% of the population died. So that means your ancestors way back in the day were too stubborn, too hardy, to pass away because of the plague. So appreciate where you came from. Uh, at its peak, it caused 10,000 deaths a day. I mean, this is, this is 
devastating. Again, we live in post-apocalyptic times compared to uh, if you ask these people. Then the next one was The Black Death. This is probably what you're familiar with. By the way, a really funny movie, if you've never seen it, is uh, Monty Python and the Holy Grail. There's an entire scene talking about the Black Death. You know, bring out your dead, bring out... And moving on. The Black Death was also known as the Great Pestilence. Now look at the time frame on this thing. This was not a, you know, a one-year, two-year, ten-year plague. This thing lasted from 1346 to 1446, and it still continued after that. So we're looking at over a hundred years of living with the plague. People were born into this, had kids, died, and their kids, I mean, this, wow, okay? It killed between 20 to 30 million people in Europe. So picture this in your head. You had the plague of Justinian, which wiped out about 50 to 60% of the population. You live in post-apocalypse times at this point. Then, fast forward, we have another apocalyptic plague that hits the world and kills or like one-third of the European population. So, again, be amazed that you're here. Your ancestors survived this, and that's why you're here. We won't even go into the Spanish flu. That's for another topic one day. So, the Black Death... Uh, the term comes from the characteristics of the disease, dark blue areas of skin caused by the hemorrhage. And if you really want to get more into the Black Death, you can look up um, information, videos, books. The Black Death had massive, massive, massive repercussions on history. It had massive repercussions on art, on religion, on politics. It changed the face of Europe, at least, as far as how everything was run. So this is pretty big. Then we have the modern plague. This started in 1855. It began in China and spread to all inhabited continents. And it killed more than 12 million people in India and China alone. Wow. The first case of the plague showed up in the US back in the 1900s at a port in San Francisco, California. If memory serves correctly, I think they um, traced it back to China. And so that's where we got our first um, dose of plague here in the country. And yes, we still do see the plague, we still see Yersinia pestis and the plague pop up from time to time. It's not gone. Uh, the World Health Organization, WHO, reports that between 1,000 to 3,000 cases worldwide each year. In 1983, the United States saw a peak number of cases at 40 people who had the plague. New Mexico accounts for more than half of the average of seven cases of plague in the U.S. every year. So what's the treatment? Well, Yersinia pestis is a bacteria. So we're going to use antibiotics. We're going to use antibiotics um, to wipe out this bacteria. If you use the right ones, it's highly effective for all presentations if, and this is the key, begun early. You gotta get this stuff at the beginning stages of the infection. If antibiotics are given within the first 24 hours after symptoms of pneumonic plague um, develops, mortality is significantly reduced. Strict isolation procedures for all cases of plague for 48 hours after initiation of antibiotic treatments. You don't want this to spread. So now let's talk about this as a biological weapon. All of this is open source information. Um, you just work for the government, so I wanna make sure that this is clear. This is all open source information. And uh, there was a group, the Unit 731. If you've never heard of Unit 731, Google them. These people were, wow. I mean, hail Hydra, right? Unit 731 reported to have dropped plague-infected fleas over populated areas of China. Uh, Unit 731 was a covert biological and chemical war research and development area within Japan. They were active during World War II, and I believe they account for most of the uh, war crime charges against Japan um, from that war. So seven, Unit 731, not the nicest of people out there. Then we have the United States and Soviet Union developing aerosolized versions of the plague. And then we have this guy right here, back in the 1990s, Larry Wayne Harris. Now you already know this guy is you know, bad. If, you got, if we call him by three names, you already know, right? So Larry Wayne Harris was arrested. He had ordered um, Yersinia pestis from American type culture collection. So he ordered in the mail the plague. Um, he was not arrested. This is the wild part. He was not arrested for ordering the plague. He wasn't arrested for the, having the plague in his person. He was arrested because he com committed mail fraud. He said he was with an organization that he wasn't with. And so that's how he was arrested. Now, obviously, laws have changed since that little loophole. 
but kind of uh, wild, bizarre stuff. So that's going to conclude this video. Be sure to check out, we have other videos in this microbiology series. Be sure to click on them. They'll take you to where you need to go and look in the description for the links. We have what are microbes, binomial nomenclatures, bacteria basics, part of the microscopes. Still on the way, we have a video on endoplasmic reticulum, anthrax, and bacterial meningitis. So I hope you enjoyed the video. Be sure to click that subscribe button and like if you learned something. And please share with your friends. It's only through you that this channel grows. Until later, have fun studying out there. Goodbye for now.